the passing of Danny Javier, lead singer of the Apple Hiking Society, has prompted a new round of reflections on the true scope of influence of the famous musical group. By any measure, they were one of the most successful musical acts in the Philippines. Their impact on Philippine popular culture was outsized. But in the mid-1980s, Apo also made an impact on Philippine history. The three members' social political commitment and their sophisticated, humorous, effective way of protesting the martial law regime through their performance art is less well known today. To spend time learning more about that political aspect of their art is a form of tribute to Danny Javier and the Apo Hiking Society. Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. In the days after Danny Javier's passing, I and a few other fans started to share recollections of Apo's protest art. It is a good thing that on YouTube and on Spotify, we can access some prime examples of that art. The live recording of one of their concerts is available, for instance. The album is called Tongue in Cheek, the worst of the Apo Hiking Society. And from context clues, it seems that that concert was the one held on November 30, 1985 at Ultra. In that concert, we hear Apo make telling jokes about President Marcos himself and his reputation. The issue of disappearing funds was known to most everyone as hidden wealth, they said. But the issue of a disappearing president, they said, was hidden health. At that time, it took a lot of guts to tell those jokes in public in front of thousands of cheering, hooting people. How and why did Apo turn political? And why did their protests take that particular form? We are joined tonight by another original Filipino music icon who shared their social political commitment and who herself played a key role in those dangerous days after the assassination of Nino Aquino in 1983. Ms. Leia Navarro, thank you for joining us in the public square. Hello, John. It's very nice to be here and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I got shocked by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sometimes you don't me, think about the things you do, you know. <laughs> let me uh, start by offering our sincere condolences on the passing of uh, one of your good friends and one of your mm -hmm. colleagues and one of the uh, pillars of the music industry. May I ask, how did you hear the news? Oh, well, um, we have a, a Viber chat, the Apo Barcada. We have a Viber chat of old friends. Um, I have known uh, the Apo and their friends for uh, 50 years now. It's been that long. And Danny, Jim, and Boo Boy uh, played a big part, not just in my life as a performer, but as a friend. Uh, they were friends. They were family, you know, they're up to now. And so we were chatting, uh, and then I... We, I saw that there was a lot of activity in our chat, and uh, that's how we got the news. Uh, at first, we were hopeful maybe what we were hearing uh, was not true, and then um, it was finally confirmed to us uh, that he had passed in, in the late afternoon you know, of the 31st. He had been sick for some time, so in a way, this was inevitable, but... I'm sure when it the news arrived, it still came as a shock. Uh, oh how, yes. How are uh, um, Jim Paredes and Dubai Garovilio uh, and their other friends taking it? You know, it's 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 like you lose an arm, I guess, or or uh, you you lose a loved one. Um, they were so close, the three of them, but they were also they had a larger family of friends and. Uh, and they are very dedicated to each other. So uh, when 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 uh, the guys heard about it, uh, 
I mean, we were all still in shock, even if it was expected. Um, we knew it would have been a matter of time, but uh, you're always hoping. You always hope that maybe, maybe he's going to hang on and he'll get better. Um, we all prayed for that. Uh, so both guys are pretty much broken up, and um, I understand you did invite both of them, uh, but they're not quite ready. Uh, I I think I can speak for them by saying that they're not quite ready to speak about how they're feeling right now. Yes, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, well, you Jim to told me I should do it. So. <laughs> and thank you to Jim for that also. I also got a message from uh, Bubu, and maybe I'll have time to, uh, I'll have an opportunity to read uh, part of that message uh, later. Um, of course, a big part of their story and their legacy is music. Uh, were you surprised that uh, Danny had even a parting gift? Uh, lahat tayo? Uh, I mean, it's... You know, we were really surprised about that, John. Mm -hmm. Not many of us not many of us knew about it. But oh, he, wow. did, he did work with Laurie Illustre. Mm -hmm. um, they put it together. Uh, Danny was like that. He had a a way of being able to surprise you. Um, he was extremely, extremely talented, extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the three guys, you can't joke, you know, you can't make jokes, you can't write songs like that unless you're extremely quick and, and, and intelligent and, and you know. Uh, and that was, that was their shared thing together. Um, and each of each of them has their own uh, style, musical style, uh, way of writing. Um, but when the apples came together, all the songs melted together. You weren't sure who wrote this, who wrote, unless of course you found out or you, or you bought their album. Um, but you always thought of them as a unit. But each of them were extremely are extremely talented people and very bright and uh, very creative and uh, although Danny had this naughty streak he was a naughtier he was sort of naughty that way you know his his uh, lyrics with uh, double meaning um, mm -hmm. you know that that characterized some of his songs and but uh, you know, to, to hear him sing that, I that broke me up. That broke me up a bit when I when I saw that and um, listened to it. Uh, you, you you notice that the the melody is so catchy, right? It's it's That's right. It, yeah, it's, it's uh, upbeat. It's upbeat, but it's such a morbid subject. You know, lahat tayo mamamatay. We're all gonna die. But see how he injected uh, some humor into it. Um, I, I can't quite explain, you know, but the feeling was so, it, it tore me apart because here you are, it's a happy, jaunty mm -hmm. melody. And he's talking about, you know, I'm going to die, you're going to die. Uh, you want to go ahead or I'll go ahead of you. Diba? That, that yeah. Those were the lyrics. And yeah. um, and he spoke the truth, though, right? We are all going to pass. And it all depends on how uh, ready we are. I suppose that's that's what he wanted to impart. That's right. His last song was uh, Memento Mori. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sure many people will be talking for uh, days about the uh, musical legacy of Apo Hiking Society, you know? Um, what I'd like to do is to focus on that particular period in their lives. Uh, uh, Buboy referred to it as an episode in their career, you know, from, I guess, 1983 to 1986, when yeah. they, they took great risks uh, uh, in um, performing uh, in the streets and also staging concerts with very political uh, content. Uh, so I wanted to focus on that, uh, okay. the protest art of the Apo Hiking Society. And I know you were very much a part of that. Um, maybe we can talk about that. Sure. Uh, my first uh, question is, uh, is it right to date 
uh, they're turning political to the Aquino assassination, or did it come oh, later it, than it, that? It was it was before that, um, mm -hmm. because uh, Jim Jim's uh, mom uh, was very uh, how do you say? And uh, she was an activist, mm -hmm. and um, you know that the. the I would think, I do not know personally, but I would think that that's where uh, the wokeness in them came out, no? mm -hmm. to, use, to use a 21st century uh, okay. word. They were woke fairly early. I would say uh, well into martial law. Uh, people were, you know, th there were already... Uh, rumblings or mm -hmm. more less than rumblings we had whisperings mm -hmm. going around in the in the late 70s mm -hmm. and um, everybody who had um, the how would you say uh, a way of finding out what was going on mm -hmm. other than what they were reading in the controlled media uh, if, if you remember right everything yeah. was absolutely control from print media to what you would watch on TV. Uh, and in a way, all performers at that time, we sort of took advantage of that and saying, okay, they want us to perform because they want the people to, to forget their troubles, right? Because mm -hmm. life was not, not easy mm -hmm. for a majority of our people. No matter what people think, they believe that there was less traffic then, it was quieter. Hello, there were only 30 million people in the Philippines at the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, life was completely different from, from what we're experiencing now. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, in under a controlled government or country, you, you didn't know what was really going on. Uh, but... Uh, you know, Jim, Danny, and Buboy, they knew they had friends, friends of friends. They had family mm -hmm. who had activist roots. Mm -hmm. um, being from the Ateneo, it wasn't so far from UP. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the I, at that time, before waking up, mm -hmm. I mean, I was one of these apolitical singers, you know, who just wanted to do their art and create and be mindless about all of these things. Um, but I have to credit them for mentoring me and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making me understand why we have to think bigger than ourselves, right? Beyond, think beyond ourselves and think about what's going on in, in the world, in our country. Um, that's how it began. So, uh, I, I remember this to be before 81 because we even when we were doing uh, Metro Manila Popular Music Festival, right, they had mm -hmm. all of these ensemble shows going on. Right. I mean, Apo was very, was already very popular then. That's right. right? This, yeah. This started like late 70s, 76, 77, when I, when I entered the business and then onwards. And then um, in 81, when they said that they were going to, uh, this so-called lifting of martial law, but the guy was mm -hmm. still there. Mm -hmm. you know, he was still in power. People were already saying, you know, this is already too much. And um, there has to be a way to push back. And uh, what was so powerful about the Apo Hiking Society is they, they, used, they used their creativity and their music and in such a, a way where it wasn't, Sorry, excuse me. A grim and determined sort of. Mm -hmm. It was always lighthearted. Yeah. Uh, uh, pasundut sundut. That was how they would do um, their jokes or uh, their songs. Just a touch. And then more and more, they would take more and more liberties and uh, live, start living more on the edge and getting more and more brave because the audience reacted the way they hoped they would react that's right i mean yeah. uh, w one of the one of the great things about listening to the live concert is the reaction of the crowd 
to the jokes, uh, to the you know the, the riffs and so on. I mean, it just yeah. really brings you back to to those heady days. Uh, before we uh, dig deeper into you know what they did together with you and your friends, I just want to point to the context that um, by the early 80s, the cultural scene in the Philippines was more or less uh, associated with the Marcoses, especially with Imelda and Aimi, right? Well, they... they, they... Artists, cultural workers, and so on. So for, for, for people to actually break out of that must have... It must have been very difficult. I mean, maybe there, are, there were some commercial... I personally, I did. I personally didn't feel that, that mm-hmm. too much. But mm-hmm. um, what I, I, what I do know is that, of course, uh, they they really cultivated culture mm-hmm. uh, and exploited, you know, the eagerness for artists to perform. Mm-hmm. Uh, all artists want to perform. We all want. You know, an audience to listen to our music, to to uh, watch our plays, see our movies, things like that. And they tapped into that and said, you know, we'll give you leeway, but you know, you do these ensemble shows, these concerts. Let's have this wonderful, you know, popular music festival where you all, you know, come out with wonderful compositions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And um, as artists. It's very hard to fight against that, right? Because you do want to get to use the title of your show, get mm-hmm. out into the public square, mm-hmm. and and be and be seen and heard, That's right. um, and that they were very good at that. So uh, some of us said, "Okay, we'll take advantage of it. No, uh, we'll we'll use them using us." But I do remember Imelda, you know, being so. You know, she, she, I was, I know she's a, a, a frustrated performer. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, she liked, I think, to live vicariously her dreams through us at that time. And so we uh, had carte blanche to do all these shows and, and we did. Um, but eventually people, you know, started to find ways. I mean, remember how Heber Bartolome was able to get into Metropop? Heber yeah. was a street folk singer who mm-hmm. sang protest songs. And then, you know, uh, right. and he he entered, he joined Metro Pop. <laughs> That's so, um, you know, some of us said, are, are they getting the message of the music or the lyrics or no? And it was going over their heads and they didn't know. And I think that's the way Apo took advantage of that as well. Where double anton or uh, double meaning, all mm-hmm. these slight subtle hints. Uh, that's how that's how people got through. And then when I think Filipinos kasi is you say it na lang for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you you say what's really I'm thinking, and I'll agree with you. That was why they responded so much to the music of Apo. Apple wrote about everything uh, that was like regular life, real life, uh, love, and then then they they would slide truths, real truths, right in there, and that helped wake people up. That's right. So they were they were more famous for their love songs, for instance. Uh, and their barcada songs, you know, it's really written well. People remember them uh, as the soundtrack of their lives. But then you also have occasionally songs like American Junk. Yeah. You know? uh, I guess this is part of the whole drive for original Filipino music, right? So that the dig at the American Top 40 and so on. Yes. Um, but when when they started protesting politically, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they decided to do it more through performance, rather through oh, yeah, rather than through the actual song. So uh, they would there would be street uh, rallies where they would perform, and then you would you know uh, unforgettable experience for for me and my generation was going to their well crafted, well staged, well produced concerts 
with all those little zingers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like uh, that, that 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 was what they were famous for. Yeah, like what? What do you remember? So first of all, the, the title of their concert series uh, was a play on the what what the assassin supposedly. Pusila, uh, pusila. Yeah. Pusila. <laughs> yes. Those, those things, and people would would pick up on that. They would also have you know jokes like say. Um, I remember that the, um, the 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 dialogue between Pedro and uh, and the American fellow uh, yeah. Jim Perez, uh, uh, and Pedro would say, "Why would I listen to you?" Uh, and then uh, Jim Perez says, "Because you owe us twenty five billion." Yeah. So you know, even at the time, I mean, we were very conscious of the fact that our foreign debt was twenty five billion dollars, yeah. and we were sinking under uh, all that weight. Um, so anyway. But, um, I, can, can you can you walk us through that you know, the decision to so essentially it was through the through the performances right? it, it, and it was their idea um, mm-hmm. there was a group uh, if I remember correctly and maybe Jim can clarify things for me later if he mm-hmm. scolds me and say it was like this no um, there were a group already of of uh, People from the from from the creative arts, uh, from television. So we had people like Tats Rehante, mm-hmm. uh, Johnny Manahan, uh, and all other uh, um, uh, people from media. Like, uh, you know, they became a, like a barcada, like a group. Oh, let's do this. Let's do this. They, you know, they would. They were thinking that way. Uh, we should go out and, and do. I was invited. Okay, by the time they're, you know, they, come on, join us, we're going to do this. And I said, but I don't sing protest songs. I don't have, okay lang yan. You know, you sing, you sing your hits. And then you, that's the thing about music. Eh? You can actually turn any song, even a love song, into a protest song, depending on, on how you introduce it, mm-hmm. right? And what you... You give them the con. You give your audience the context of how you want them to listen to the song. Mm-hmm. So you know, a, a song could be about uh, a guy uh, loving this girl, and it's a love song. But mm-hmm. you know, you could also say that he's talking about loving his country. Mm-hmm. And then you know, they, and I think that's the way uh, Apo uh, would do things. So we were joined by. Um, so Apo was like the headliner thing. They were the ones talaga who were the root of all of this. Then mm-hmm. we'd have Subas and Noel. Mm-hmm. Remember Subas? Uh, Hello and Noel Trinidad. Uh, Noel. And mm-hmm. that's, that's Champoy, di ba? With mm-hmm. Mitch and Mitch mm-hmm. Valdez. Mitch Valdez so, yeah. and, and they were very brave too. So, you know, they would join. Uh, me as the, being one of the youngest, if not the youngest. In the group, I just joined because you know we got to do this. Is new for me, the mm-hmm. closeted kid from Forbes Park, right? <laughs> Who didn't know uh, this was the greening of on a personal note. This was the greening of me, mm-hmm. and uh, they, I think they, they really helped me find my my courage, because you really had to have some kind of courage especially the three of them and the whole group to stand there you know on on a makeshift stage on the on you know on the back of a, a six by four or what you know those mm-hmm. trucks yes and mm-hmm. you appear out of nowhere and then you do this thing like what your friend said to you right going uh in we would do this in ayala center mm-hmm. in front of quad uh, yeah what was quad quad. yeah mm-hmm. So the way you know the setup was like in 10 minutes you're set up you do your songs and then b- b- before you hear the metrocom <clears throat> supposedly on its way wala na tayo Who, Who, whose idea na was tayo? whose idea was the lightning concert sila sila jim sila not sila jim the sila apo um mm-hmm. i know that johnny manan was part of it my memory is, is not so uh, sharp on that anymore because that was like a blur. Mm-hmm. That was like a blur. And um, obviously that was... Yeah. <laughs> that was a blur by design. <laughs> yeah, I you know. What a change. 
<laughs> strange choice of words, I know, all of a sudden. Um, and this was already, it. of course, this was already after they had uh, shot Ninoy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and when, when they did, when, when, when they, that's when we really ramped things up because also when you're doing it and you're out there and you feel the fervor of the audience, you know that you're changing something, you know that you are affecting, you're having an effect on the people and you are trying to impart your courage to them that's what they did their mm -hmm. their songs the american junk the, mm -hmm. the the double meaning songs mm -hmm. or and then the spiels that they would have that's right you know like you said you know how uh they, they would slide things in and people like you said would hoot and holler because they knew it was true they knew it was true and when they know that somebody else is saying it out loud they feel less afraid. And, yeah. and yeah. it's amazing to, to, to listen to the live recording, for instance, and hear people react no? uh, when, for instance, uh, Pedro, the character Pedro, Danny Javier says, yeah. uh, mas maroon ako pa sa presidente namin. No? Yung presidente namin, binoboto namin yan. And then you can hear the crowd like a, uh, like a, <laughs> You, you can see the crowd suspending its disbelief. It's like, yes, right. And yes, then, yes. and then, and then he comes in with a punchline and he says, uh, "Sa bagay, eh, nabibili naman yung boto namin." And then you can see the crowd. You can hear the crowd collapsing in laughter. Yeah, yeah. That's because they knew it was true. They knew it was true. But you know, the laughter was also partially, uh, I think, out of. Well, not fear. Fear is too strong a word. But I think there was some catharsis there, really. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, that's the way. Like for instance, this one. This is one of the things that really got me on. Re I've been listening uh, to the albums again no? since the last few days. Uh, when um, they even make jokes about Marcos's pronunciation, his diction, as, as yes. say, his diction. You know, he, he's a formidable intellect and all that. But yet, you know, he would say, people would say, uh, and, and Jim would say, he would say, say, say it this way, assassin. And Pedro assassin. would say, assassin, because that's the way that Marcus would say. And people would laugh. It's maroon ako pa sa presidente namin. It's like, yeah. wow, they actually made, you know, they took direct aim at the, at the dictator. I mean, wow. And, yeah, and the dictator lost his sheen that way. Yeah. He lost his power. They 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 uh, chipped at his power that way and chipped away at it by these you know very subtle insults, very subtle digs, and people felt I think later on more emboldened uh, and and less afraid because then they saw oh, tao nga pala may sakit pa. Yeah, my hidden health does. Yeah. Oh, oh, hidden health. And, you know, a lot of people, they that that was when the rumor mill was going, right? Mosquito That's press right. was started right. to come out. Sila Leti mm -hmm. were doing all sorts of good things. And I think in the end, it was like the, the arts, journalism, mm -hmm. music. Uh, these were the vehicles by which EDSA was shaped, EDSA 1986. That slow, you know, that slow burn towards the revolution. But no one intended it naman to be a revolution, right? And, and you know, we were all there. Jim was at Channel 4. That's right. Uh, Noel and Subas and I were out on the streets uh, in... Uh, Edsa and Santolan and Ortigas and Bonnie Serrano. We were all there in that area. Edu Manzano was there too. He went, okay, I remember seeing him. Mahan Hontiveros. Uh, as I said before, uh, mm -hmm. Johnny Manahan, Tats Manah. Everyone was there. Everybody was there. And Sila Celeste also were there. Uh, you, it, it, we brought, we helped bring this 
I like to think of it, and I'm, I don't know if people say, oh, masyado ka naman mayabang. But I think the Apo, uh, the, the singers, shows like Champoy, you know, with the subtle digs, mm -hmm. I think this, this is what helped people find their courage to finally come out on the streets on those four fateful nights. And, you know, here we are, uh, almost 50 years later. I, I agree with you. No, I, I had the privilege of uh, doing a documentary way back in 2006 for the 20th anniversary of EDSA. And uh, among the subjects that interviewed uh, uh, was uh, Jim Paredes. But another subject we interviewed was uh, Gringo Honasan, who gleefully recounted that he was at one of those Apple concerts. Uh, it was probably the one in January uh, at the Loyola Center. January 1986, and he recalls that while people were cheering and laughing and so on, he was thinking, "Malapit, hindi nila alam malapit na ang luso." Yeah, but yeah. they laid their plans for, for uh, you know, taking over Malacanang and so on. Yes, yeah. It's interesting to me, you know, how how these different uh, vectors of history, you know, intersect. Uh, I think people know when when things are nigh, when things have come to, you know, to a certain point where things will break or when the things come together. Um, but but uh, during that time, the music of Apo is really what helped fuel all of this, and 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 it's it's. You, if you if you go to an Apo concert, after the concert, it's not like as if okay, I'm gonna go home, I'll go to sleep. You know that mm -hmm. their music stays with you, mm -hmm. and people stayed and they would sit and they would talk. And then, of course, because of the jokes and all that, it wouldn't be surprising if people on their way home, on the mm -hmm. bus or you know, in the taxi or in their cars, they would say. Oh, uh, alam mo yung sinabi ni Jim o sinabi ni Danny o sinabi ni Bubuy. Totoo pala yun. Diba? That's, that's how things, uh, they, they made people think. They made people ponder, you know, and, and also say, boy, if they're, if they're brave, bakit kami? Dapat tayo na rin maging brave. I, I prepared one question, but you've already answered it on many uh, points now, which is uh, uh, what made them click. So, you know, they were funny. Uh, it, they made people think. Their songs are catchy. Of course, they were courageous. All those things. I, I, wanted, I want to ask you, how did they get away <laughs> with, you know, with taunting the president, with these lightning <laughs> rallies? Because they had so many fans. So I, this is just me out of now, just now. Mm -hmm. think. I think that if they had sent the Metrocom for them, mm -hmm. people would get really angry. And maybe we would have had Edsa before without having to have Enrile and Ramos there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when, when stars endear themselves to their, to their fans, there are many fans who are like what you know they call diehard fans mm -hmm. i mean now the example for that i guess would be bts right mm -hmm. their army right. yeah. um but you know i wouldn't uh, the apple had that kind of following as well i mean up to this day uh, their their songs um have stood the test of time and if you did American Junk now, I would I would think Jim and Bubui would just tweak the lyrics a little bit, and it you know they'll make it twenty first century, because music is like that. You know their creativity uh, is a legacy that that lasts forever. You know even if Danny is gone now, all his music um, continues to live and continues to inspire. Um, I of course you know they're super creative guys, super talented. Um, and the audiences, their fans really love them. You know, it's a love. In the uh, Edsa documentary that I was a part of, uh, Jim said this incredible thing. Uh, he said he wrote 
uh, the Edsa song, uh, he Handong. said, he, Handong na Pilipinas sa mundo, he said, I wrote that five minute song in two minutes. Yeah. No? So he just, he came back from Edsa, sat down at the piano, and then he said, you know, a five minute song came out in two minutes. And it's like, okay, so that's a glimpse at their creativity. Can you, you know, some behind the scenes <laughs> Uh, look at the, how, how they interacted creatively and so on. We, you know, we um, we we recorded that a scant, I think, two months or less after Edsa. Oh, because I, I think it was really soon, like March or something like that. That's right. Yeah, I think it was yeah. a month after. Yeah. Yes, um, and and. Uh, we are records was so nice you know to have it all prepared and and mm -hmm. uh, everybody everybody wanted to be part of that song it was like a we are the world song That's right it. that that That's is it. the feel of it mm -hmm. and uh i remember you know everybody wanted a, a line there was supposed to be uh mm -hmm. solo solo whoever was at <laughs> Never forget Celeste saying that she wanted that line. Mm -hmm. Kay sarap pala maging Pilipino. That was her line. And she and all of us were like, Ay, naku, Celeste, she really wanted that song. <laughs> that, that line. I mean, we, we all wanted to be part of it. And we were mm -hmm. all, uh, because we had lived it. And Jim had encapsulated the feeling in that song. You know the melody, the that that feeling of elation and euphoria, because we we really felt victorious when they left. No matter what they try to say now, they left. Mm -hmm. For us, that was like we got them out. That was the thought. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what happened after? We can all argue on all that, but at that moment. When they left, and we realized, you know, that staying those three nights on the street really did something. We really changed our country. And people, 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 you know, uh, people misunderstand our, uh, you know, a devotion to that time, uh, for want of a better word, are because. Unless you lived it, unless you went through it, you really won't understand why we felt the depth of of being Filipino then. You know, we felt, oh, we had come to this. We and and like 14 years, right? 14 years of this mm -hmm. guy, and now he's gone, and we got him out because we did a whole bunch of people, a whole you know, hundreds of thousands of people. It wasn't just in EDSA. They had people in Cebu. They had people in Davao also um, who were also protesting and, and holding their ground and, and holding on to the, you know, to the belief that it's time. It's time. It's time for them to go. That's it. And so when, when Jim wrote uh, uh, Handog, all the words that he said there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The feeling of unity, oneness. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first, it really was unprecedented, the first people power revolution. And it's really true that this was our gift. There is an English version. I don't know if you know that, John. There's an English version that we also recorded of this. And, and in English, it is, and to the world, we sing out and we say that we have found a new and better way. So th this was our message. Oh, thank you. I did not know that. <laughs> uh, you can, um, you just I, have I to Google yeah. Uh, yeah. A New and Better Way by Jim Paredes. And that is the English version of Handog ng Pilipino sa Mundo. We're, we're running a little long, but uh, I, <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to ask, no, no, so, no this is, Fascinating. I, I, I want to ask one more question about uh, Danny. Uh, many people remember him as Pedro. In fact, when news spread that he had passed away, people said, rest in peace, uh, Pedro, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I, I guess part of that is, you know, uh, he, he, he was the one born in the Visayas. Jim was born in Luzon. Bubay was born in Mindanao. Dumaguete, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he, uh, yeah. But how much of the Pedro persona was his personality? I mean, what, what I heard about the Visaya was that, yeah. you know, accent and all that, he, he was a very smart uh, fellow, this, uh, this Pedro yeah. uh, character. How much of that was Danny? No, that's really all Danny. That's really all that. That's not, you know, how some people create a character and it's all artifice. Mm -hmm. No, there's a lot of that that's really Danny. You know, the, the regular guy, guy that's Danny. The But but there was also the Danny who was um, extremely uh, intelligent, uh, entrepreneur type guy who wanted, you know, business. And then there was the Danny who's the artist. But the regular Danny, he was easygoing guy. Hindi siya masyadong mabigat as they say. Um, but his humor was very... Uh, in, and the other two guys, to their humor is so, is so intelligent, but they but they don't come out that way you know what i mean they're not out to impress you with i'm really smart i'm really their their quips they come naturally it's the same with with uh with danny he 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 talked that way not with the accent or anything but <clears throat> he was he was uh, uh, a colorful guy he he had a colorful personal life, you know, yet he, he was a father, he was a husband, uh, he, he made a lot of people happy, uh, but, you know, he wasn't also perfect. So all of us, in, you know, we all had our differences from time to time. But as Pedro, that, that was like the inner side of him, you know, the kid that grew up in Maasin Leyte. Uh, that came from there. And uh, that was like going back to his roots. And, you know, the T-shirts that he'd come up with, you know, the bright, colorful designs, mm -hmm. that's that's also, uh, I guess, a personification. Am I sure you've seen the right, I know, of, of Danny's being? He was bright. He was uh, not really... I, I can't use loud. Um well, he was the most outgoing of the three, mm -hmm. you know. And and somebody somebody mentioned uh, on Twitter to me that, that he was he called Danny the Quiet Apple, and I said <laughs> he couldn't have been more wrong, you know. Um, but he, the context pala was because um, Jim and Bubu are still performing, and then Danny just sort of. Uh, went into the background but by then because he had his health he had his health uh challenges by then yes um i got uh, this uh, note a uh, very gracious note uh, of rejection <laughs> uh from uh Bubo garbilio uh but I, I didn't ask his permission but maybe i can read just a, a short line uh from from his note where he said Yes, Danny was a staunch defender of what you'd call Maralita, and Lenny refers to as Nasa Lailayan. I believe he had marched uh, uh, in the streets way before we even got there. Yeah, because, you know, Danny uh, came from what people would call humble beginnings, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he worked his way um, through the world. Uh, you could tell, you know, on his face that he had been through some challenges uh, in life, but he also had a lot of success, but he also had a big heart for people who he could identify with, right? Because um, he had been there. He had been there. And... Uh, I think in the end, all of us, I mean, their influence on me was, and that's not, 
you know, that's the three of them together. Because Danny is my compadre. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am the I am the ninang of his eldest daughter. So we were really close. I met these guys when I was 15 years old. So I have known them for 50 years. And they, I must say, they uh, loom large in my life. And I'm very grateful to them and to Danny for that. Because, you know, they, they, they taught me that loving your country is not a waste, no matter what it does to you. Especially like for what we're going through now, mm -hmm. where people keep asking, right, on social media, why are we doing this? Why do we shoot ourselves in the foot? I don't have the answer to that. But what I do know that Danny, Jim, and Boo Boy did impress on me that you don't give up. You never give up, it's especially when it comes to your country because your country makes you who you are, you know, where you come from. And, and I think that's uh, a big gift that Danny has left for us. And I hope that, you know, people understand that and, and, and keep, you know, get some value out of that. I'm grateful that uh, you were able to share uh, your time with us. Uh, thank you, Ms. Leah Navarro, for sharing your time and your insights and your personal pleasure. experience. The thank pleasure, you. John. Yeah. Thank you for your work. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.